All right. So uh, to, we had previously talked about introduction to modeling. Today we'll talk about sim modeling in specifically, but let's uh, uh, quickly jump to, as a reminder, if you have any anonymous questions or questions you would like to ask uh, during the lecture, but you just don't want to speak up or have your name attached to it, you can go to this QR code or this URL and post them there. We've got a console that keeps track of those here. If I don't get to those questions during the class, then I'll do my best to answer them in the discussions on Canvas afterwards. So that's always um, available there. Um, otherwise, the uh, reminders um, moving forward, there's it's not formally assigned yet, but uh, lecture B1 will be on Tuesday. And once we get through that content, you should have enough to be able to start on homework B1. So that's when that homework is formally assigned, but it is currently available. So if you'd like to start on that ahead of time, homework B1 is two questions. The first question is very similar to lab one. So uh, you're going to be asked to um, list um, a bunch of different uh, examples um, of, for modeling a, you know, three different systems, similar to how you did in lab one, and we will sort of formally define those terms today. Um, and then the second part of homework B1, that's kind of the, the new part, is you're going to hand simulate a discrete event system simulation of a pretty simple queuing system. And that, um, if, again, we'll go over that next week, but there's also a help video that's posted on Canvas right underneath the homework B1 if you'd like to get a, a jump start on that material. So that's available. Lab two is also available. All the labs are currently available and all the ICAs are currently available. Um, so ICA B2 is also available. So that ICA is supposed to help you read through chapter, um, uh, the next chapter. And, uh, and I forget numerically if that's chapter two in the book or chapter three in the book. I'd have to double check that. But um, the idea is that that's targeted on helping you with the material before uh, uh, Thursday's lecture, the, the lecture a week from today. So um, ICAs, there's about 15 of them. You get seven that are dropped. So of course, you don't have to do all of them, but they're meant to give you kind of a weekly way to make sure that you have processed the material we have covered and have um, read up on the material we're about to cover so that um, so they're just supposed to help you keep engaged but again I'm not making you do all of them if it seems like there's a lot of them just emphasizing again there's a pretty healthy drop policy on the ICAs and they're all available out there right now so those are the reminders um, any questions or anything that I uh, need to go over before we start into the new content for today No, all right. Great, all right, so um, as I mentioned before, we talked about introduction of modeling and now we're going to get a little more specific. So just as a review, um, we as industrial and systems engineers, we, uh, whereas a lot of other engineers, they can, the knowledge they have about the systems they work on comes from science. So you can, although you might work with scientists, then a lot of other engineering you pick uh, it's sort of like applied science. So you were given a set of models, a set of frameworks, and then you use those frameworks to do, to build useful things that you can then um, uh, provide to human society. That's sort of what we do as engineering. But as industrial systems engineers, we have to do kind of both the science and the engineering because these complex systems of humans and technology and the natural world, physical world, all coming together sort of require their own um, science. And so they require us to gather data and to build new models as opposed to using models. We don't have um, the laws of thermodynamics um, for a traffic intersection. We don't have Newton's laws um, for a factory floor we have to come up with those ourselves and test them. And so we do experiments, we build models, and we make inferences about those models. And then using those, we then go over and we then do the engineering as well. And so um, in this class, we are working on kind of both of those. And so how do we build models that we can then run experiments on and then use those models to then uh, test ideas that we come out on the engineering side. So that's kind of, um, you know, our introduction to why we need models. And then so last time we also then said, you know, what are models? 
and I'm saying that we need a definition that covers all of these things from fashion models to organismal animal models in the laboratory to the Bohr model of the atom. And my claim was that a good answer to a general a definition to what our models, our models provide answers to what if questions. Um, I frequently go into say committee meetings with PhD students, so say computer scientists, and, and they're building models, you know, simulation models or mathematical models. And I'll ask them, you know, what a model is. And I think we often as quantitative people forget about the general definition of what a model is. And they say, well, it's something that has to use mathematics or something that has to use a computer or, um, in order to do these things. But a model doesn't require, it, a model is not what it's made of, it's how it's used. So a model could be um, a piece of paper that um, I, I, I say, well, you know, if I need to demonstrate something to you, I might grab a piece of paper and say, um, you know, Earth's crust, you know, when, uh, when it comes together and it forms mountains, well, I might grab a piece of paper and I might squeeze it together and then it forms kind of a peak. And then that becomes a model of plate tectonics, right? You know, that piece of paper it's, is, is a model. So models provide answers to what if questions. They're how they're used. You wouldn't think of a piece of paper as a model until I buckle it together and get a mountain to form, a model of a mountain. So, you know, th these are, I'm just, these are things you might see on a midterm or whatever. I might ask you, um, you know, the, the conceptual questions about what a model is. Instead of, I'd say, you know, is a, um, does a model require X, Y, or Z? And it turns out it doesn't require anything to be built into it. It required the requirement for something to be a model is how it's used. Is it answering a what if question? So um, we build artificial models like simulation models um, to help us gain understanding before experimenting on the real world. So the real world is ultimately where we are going to have to act, uh, but we need something that is of comparable complexity, but maybe not too complex. And so we, part of the reason we build simulation models is to make them kind of safer. But the other part of the reason is it allows us to add, to trickle in the complexity so that we don't have to just add all of the complexity all at once. It might be that in order for us to do the engineering, we don't need to actually have the entire, the real boat on the real ocean. We might find that we have a more general principle to apply to a much wider range of boats if we just trickle in a little bit of the complexity at a time. So we don't have to simulate everything, but we can simulate a little bit more than we would if we just use a simple math model. So, um, so that's um, you know this this is a kind of a weird thing to think about, but reducing realism can actually increase generalizability. We learned a lot about the Titanic when it went down, but the things that we learned were about boats like the Titanic in waters like the waters where the Titanic went down. Now, uh, so if we wanted to generalize to much smaller boats, to boats in other waters, those sorts of things, then um, the Titanic might not be a good model for that. But uh, maybe if we built a simulation that could generate catastrophes like this, simulated catastrophes, it might tell us something about the Titanic, but then if we adjust the levers slightly, then it might also tell us about other things as well. So we want to reduce the realism so that we can cover a wider range of phenomena, as wide a range as possible for us to still answer the question of interest. Okay, and so in order to do that, we're going to need math, we're going to need statistics and we're going to need programming, um, combining that all in together. Some people come into their first stochastic simulation course in industrial engineering and they view it as a programming course. This is the arena course, for example, but it's much more than programming. It's, um, it's a lot more about this theory and, and because before you can even get into the programming, we need to make sure we're building sims, we're programming sims that provide useful insights and do it in a way that's computationally tractable. You don't want to build a sim that when you hit play runs is slower than the real world system. And so if it's that complex, then maybe you just go out and use the real world system. So in order for us to figure out how to have useful models that are uh, run efficiently on computers, we are going to need good statistical methods. And so math and stats are going to be a big part of, of this. And we're going to combine all of these together um, into 475. The math comes before the midterm. That's kind of probabilistic modeling, which we'll sort of start talking about today. Statistics comes after the midterm. 
that's the statistical methods to make sense of whether we built good models and how do we use those models to then do something useful in the world. And then the programming um, is sort of coming uh, primarily during the lab exercises where we get to practice these kind of theoretical aspects in a concrete platform like ARENA where we can actually start building these sims. And you won't start working with ARENA until like lab five. You'll work with um, simulating in simpler platforms like a spreadsheet before that. And then you'll also work with an agent-based modeling uh, lab, I think lab four, where we use a program called NetLogo to give you a flavor of a different type of sim. So there's still a stochastic modeling and agent-based modeling, but it's, um, it, it just works in a slightly different way. And so then we hit uh, you know, hard into the discrete event system simulation starting about lab five, and then it's arena all the way out from there. All right. So, that was the review of where we've come. So before we go into the new stuff, are there any questions about all that? Is it clear what I mean about models, answering what if questions, um, how electrons don't exist, they're just models for how matter works, or anything else? Are there any other questions that I can help with in the chat uh, or um, by uh, you know, unmuting in the um, question slide or in the questions link? Let's give a couple of seconds. When I ask for questions, again, just to kill that air, I'll often talk. You can interrupt me, like, you know, when the question slides are up. In fact, when I'm just in general, if I'm lecturing and there's like something you're really like, man, that didn't make sense to me and I need to pause, just make, just, you know, shout out either in the chat or even unmuting and, and we can pause just like you would in class, you know, raising your hand. Oh, and as a quick update, um, I think we have found an instructional assistant for this class. We now have to go through the HR process of hiring that person, but then once they're hired, then um, there will be an opportunity for people to actually come to the classroom um, to view the class. I will still be remote, but if you would prefer to, to uh, take place in, it'll still, it'll be remote, but it'll be broadcast into the classroom. So if you prefer to participate in the class, uh, then we should have an option for that. Uh, I got a question um, under the uh, meeting pulse where someone asked, is ARENA compatible with a Mac? Um, unfortunately, ARENA is a Windows program, but um, so if you have parallelization, you can run ARENA. Um, that's what I do. I run a Mac. And, uh, but you also can connect to the SIDC remote labs and it's installed on them. So a lot of the Mac students who want to work on ARENA uh, off campus um, will connect to the virtual labs remotely and run arena in a remote window and there's instructions for how to do that on the canvas site under the kind of arena resources at the top so if you go to modules there's a bunch of arena resources kind of at the top to be able to find that all right so let's move on then and start focusing on simulation and then stochastic simulation so um, there are three major simulation methodologies that when people talk about simulation. Um, there's agent-based modeling, um, system dynamics modeling, which if you've taken or are thinking of taking IE 477, that focuses on system dynamics modeling. And then there's discrete event system simulation modeling. I actually don't teach 477, by the way, but I teach a course in sustainability where we use the same textbook for um, system dynamics modeling. And uh, there are courses in WP Carey who also do that. So just as a, as just kind of a, an example, system dynamics modeling up here, um, there's, it's a, it's used in a wide range of fields, even inside engineering and outside engineering. And there are a bunch of different courses that even use the same textbooks teaching to different uh, populations of students. So, but this course we focus on discrete event system simulation modeling. But let's then make sure that we know for contrast what these others are all about. So system dynamics modeling, again, this is the one that um, 477, it's kind of like if you were an engineering management major, you're required to take 477. That's kind of like the EM version of this class. So you get a simulation class in engineering management you're required to do, it's that one. You get a simulation course in industrial engineering you're required for, and that's this one. So system dynamics modeling is um, a little bit like modeling calculus-based modeling, but it's computer-aided calculus-based modeling. And so rather than considering all of the variations that it could occur on microscopic you know, uh, time, so 
um, uh, you consider sort of smooth average trends. And so you can say on average, uh, it, uh, we get um, a certain number of people come to class each day. And we might want to model how that average changes um, over a semester. So maybe you get a, a lot more people coming to class initially and a lot less people towards the end. Maybe it always increases just before a midterm or whatever. Um, and so the rather than sort of uh, modeling the day by day variations, you model these averages and you look for mathematics that governs these averages. And again, it looks like a lot of like calculus based mathematics. And so um, it focuses, uh, but instead of writing them out in math and then integrating them manually, you put them into a computer, into a graphical formulation that kind of looks like this icon over here and you hit run and by run it's just numerically integrating the calculus that behind the scenes is generated by drawing these diagrams and so these have usually long horizons if you think about calculus you think about limiting processes and you, you know for these smooth type of things you're sort of again not interested in the day by day you're interested in kind of how trends change over time in order to build these things you focus on causal interdependencies and so you know that like for class attendance um, there might be a relationship with, um, you know, the, just the, the time within the season. So uh, earlier in the season, people are more likely, they're more enthusiastic. And later in the season, they're more worried about the final exam. But in the middle, maybe they're less enthusiastic. There might also be other causal interdependencies. So again, there's a midterm coming up. And so you focus on these causal links, and then you see how it affects the average pattern. So we do not explicitly model individuals. We can model the average individual or what a group of individuals would do. It's like instead of modeling particles, we model waves. The advantages to this approach is by modeling these averages, these sims are very fast. They require very few parameters because you're not capturing all that variation. You're just capturing the, the coarse average uh, behavior of systems. And so uh, they're potentially very generalizable because again, you're not trying to explain these day-to-day -day variations. So, um, you know, a university here versus a university there, maybe the day-to-day -day variations are different, but the average patterns are the same. A disadvantage is that you lose these small scale variations that can be important. Maybe I really need to know um, if there's a, um, I might need to know that, that in a bank, for example, that there's a, I'm never going to get a pulse of customers more than a particular level because that would maybe be too much for me to hold inside the bank. So simply knowing the average number of people who come to the bank every hour doesn't help me know if I have enough capacity to hold them because each individual hour, there might be a huge number or a large or a small number. The average doesn't tell me that. So that's the disadvantage of system dynamics modeling. A hey, system dynamics hey, professor. Yep. Uh, sorry, could you um, explain a little bit what uh, causal interdependencies means a little bit more? Sure. Um, and so, and maybe if I jump ahead real quick. So this is um, what I meant kind of by causal interdependency. So I'll jump back. But like if we were doing a system dynamics model of an airport, then one of the first things we do is build what's called a causal loop diagram like this one. And we come up with all of these variables that we think might affect airport delays, for example, and then we try to come up with how they're interrelated. And so we might know that uh, refueling has a, um, uh, if, the time, if you need to do a lot of refueling, that will increase delays. And so there's a little plus here. But um, we might know that um, uh, if you increase um, standards, maybe that decreases delays because um, the higher quality aircrafts will need less maintenance because they'll have less defects and things like that. And so looking for, we throw out every possible variable we think we could model quantitatively. And then we say, which variable is related to each other? And if I increase one variable, does that cause an increase or a decrease in the other variable? And that's what these kind of pluses or minuses are. Does that help explain what I mean? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, an example of what uh, comes out of these causal loop diagrams. So this is, um, or what comes out of these stock and flow diagrams that result in this kind of second step of that is when you run one of these sims, you've got a sim that kind of looks like this one where you've got these stocks and flows. And this is a simulation of how a product is adopted 
into a population. And so initially you have a bunch of individuals who do not own the product, they don't own the iPhone, um, but then there are, um, you get sort of an infection of a couple of people who get the iPhone. So you sort of force a couple people to become adopters and then those adopters end up uh, talking to the potential adopters and the potential adopters end up um, becoming new adopters and then adopters. And so these three boxes, potential adopters, new adopters and adopters, graphically you can see they're large and they're getting small and they're getting large again. And this is model modeling these average patterns. And so, and this is all being plotted up here. Um, so you've got the uh, new adopters and then these other variables, imitators and so on. And so a system dynamics model, you draw these diagrams, you connect them up, you learn this kind of connection syntax and um, but every connection again can be written as a as a calculus equation as a differential equation and then when you hit run then it effectively does a numerical integration and then these curves that come out across the top which are just being visualized with all of these bubbles that are expanding and, and falling and all that are basically just solving integration problems you wrote a differential equation that represented how one thing modified another you hit play and it numerically integrated underneath them and then it shows you the trace of what happens out of that and so um, this is basically like mathematical modeling but just with computer aided um, assistance so as mentioned the way these system dynamics modeling start you start with these causal loop diagrams and then those things help you build these so-called stock and flow diagrams where you have stocks which are these so-called state variables in the model and we're going to talk about state variables in our models uh, a little bit later here um, and those state variables are changed by ways of flows so you might have heard of stock and flow modeling well stock and this is what stock and flow modeling is all about you've got these variables which are just, um, just these um, are not state variables. These are maybe come in from, these are like parameters from the environment coming in. Then you've got these flows, which are kind of like the derivatives. So they're kind of like the, the right-hand side of the differential equation. And then you've got the stocks, which are kind of like the left-hand side of the differential equation. These are what happens when you integrate the flows. So all of these things end up contributing to equations for flows and those flows get integrated and that ends up, uh, the integration ends up providing um, a, um, the, the integrated variable that comes out of that will end up being the stock and that's what ended up being plotted in these, these diagrams or in these simulations. So again, it's all about the average behavior. And so in that particular airport behavior, you might say, all right, we're going to, um, we have a bunch of different parameters for the airport and we are interested in a particular delay in the airport over a long period of time. And we can see that um, when we, we have three different cases, so these are uh, parameters set um, when we decrease them, these are parameters set uh, when uh, our baseline, these are the parameters set when we increase them. And we can see that over long periods of time, the average delay will end up um, decreasing um, uh, in the most with this decrease in parameters. But again, this is plotting the average delay, not like the maximum delay or, uh, or anything like that. So just it's the, the trends over time. So these system dynamics models capture. But again, that's not the main focus of this course. We will talk a little bit in this course about agent-based modeling. So it's on the flip side of the continuum. So the system dynamics modeling that was like the average behavior of systems at a coarse grain, like what, is, what do populations do? I don't care about the individuals. I just wanna know what kind of like, where the mass, the central mass of this giant blob of the population goes. On the flip side of that is agent-based modeling. Agent-based modeling is where you've got microscopic behaviors of systems. You actually model every single individual in the system. So, and, they, and how they interact. And when those individuals come together, what do they do when they come together and so on and so forth. And so you've got a lot of complexity here. When you simulate an airport with an agent-based model, you build a model of every single passenger that goes through that airport. And as that passenger bumps into TSA agents and bumps into each other. And so you have to have rules for the govern each individual passenger. And you have no idea what's going to happen when you put a thousand of these passengers together. You just know what happens for each individual passenger. So this term complexity comes up. 
a complex system is one of these systems where the properties of the large system emerge in a non-trivial way from properties of the small system. I understand the individual. I don't understand what happens when I put a thousand individuals together. Well, the simulation helps answer that. You put a thousand hypothetical individuals together, watch them bounce around, and then see what happens coming out of that. So it can be very spatially explicit. You can incorporate lots of microscopic details. So it's potentially very realistic. The downside is much slower to simulate because the computer's got to keep track of all of these degrees of freedom. It can be very difficult to understand because the systems you get out, like you might be able to get a really cool simulation result, but it can be as much of an enigma as the real airport. So your simulated airport might be just as incomprehensible as your real airport. All you can hope for is that your simulated airport is similar enough to the real airport that if you experiment on the simulated airport, the results that you get out of that will generalize to the real airport, but you don't really even have a lot of confidence about that. So they're much more difficult to kind of set and get right if you're trying to make them uh, identically mimic a system. So here's like a couple of different examples. Um, I'll show one that's animated here in the next slide, but you can imagine, say, simulating a city grid with uh, each individual car. Now notice that now that I've, I know the individual rules um, for the cars, um, some of the, there's a lot of simplicity here, like, well, maybe a city doesn't look like this. Well, I've added a whole lot of detail into the car, but I haven't added a whole lot of detail into like a realistic city block. So this is an, another example of how the lack of realism increases generalizability. So you might think this looks like a cartoon scenario, but the fact that each individual car runs by its own rules gives me the, in, at least is much better than say, just a mathematical model of traffic flow. Because a mathematical model of traffic flow, you have no individuality on these cars. So in much that looks like a simplistic cartoon, we've actually trickled in a lot more real, uh, realism, a lot more degrees of freedom. Disease spread, likewise here, these individuals might move around and bump into each other. Some of them might be infected, some of them might be recovered, some of them might be susceptible. So we can build mathematical models of disease spread that don't have this spatial, uh, ex don't make space explicit. And so, um, but here we can see that we might get a cluster of individuals that are sick in this area. And if uh, they stay clustered in this area, then all these susceptible individuals may not have a chance of getting sick. So you can experiment with things like quarantine by actually putting them on a grid where they can't interact with each other unless they get within a small bubble. And then um, the other sort of, you know, things you can simulate is, is even if they're not moving in physical space, you can do like here is a uh, agent-based model of um, a uh, power grid system. So you've got uh, generators and distribution systems and houses, and you can all put them together. And in this case, you're not interested in how they move and bump around with each other, but you're interested in kind of how they interact on the grid. So, you know, a particular house maybe increases its power that might affect the power available to other houses, which will change how they change their parameters. So even though they're not physically bumping into each other, they're sort of bumping into each other through the grid. So um, we are then simulating the individual level rules of each individual house and the individual rules of how the system reacts to these loads and these demands. Um, so here is like a simulation um, example of, um, yeah, so here is a, an agent-based model of an airport. It's a very, again, it's simplistic. You've got a bunch of these individuals. They even gave them little suitcases just for visualization's sake. Um, these individuals are in an area before a bunch of lanes here. So these are the lanes that they go through to have their luggage getting scanned. So these are their um, the security lanes and then they'll come out and then they can exit to gates over here. So these are the metal detectors and the gates. Now, um, what you'll see when this runs, so I'll hit run here and hopefully this, you can see the sim running, is that these, um, these individuals are moving around, they're bumping into each other. I can do what I'm doing here on the left-hand side here in this recorded video is I'm turning on and off different cues. So sometimes there's more cues that are available and sometimes there's not. In many ways, this is not very realistic whatsoever because this is not how people line up in an airport. They don't just cluster into some random area and then get pushed through the queues. 
Um, and so in that case, you could criticize this model for that. But on the other hand, you might ask, um, what is the kind of fundamental effect of opening cues in these or opening more metal detectors? And you might be interested in teasing out the difference between how you're queuing people up in the waiting area versus how you're um, sending them through the metal detectors. And so you can use this as what I'm going to call a null model, where you could say, well, what if just they arrived randomly at the queues? then how would things result? Well, that's really what's happening here, is that we are not worried about how they're lining up. We're just saying, if we could manage to get them to randomly pop up um, at different queues, and then how does our, our choice of, of how many queues we have staffed going to um, affect um, this, this policy? And so it's, um, and so I, I mentioned it's a null model because it's sort of like if you wanted to experiment with different ways they could arrive here, those would be kind of your treatment cases. And this is almost like a control case. So again, it doesn't look very realistic. It's kind of cartoony, but it is much, much more realistic. I mean, you can see the variation coming out of the graphs here. Then we would get out of a very smooth kind of calculus-based model of an airport. So. Uh, so like I said, a common strategy is using agent-based models, the kind of a null model of system behavior. All right, and then so what we talk about in this class is a blend of system dynamics modeling and agent-based modeling known as discrete event system simulation. And so in discrete event systems, we have individuals that we're not um, referring, referring to as, as agents because they don't have agency. They are entities, but they are these passive entities that are kind of like marbles that get kicked from one process to another. So discrete event system simulation is often called process centric because you basically have these entities show up and a process determines whether they wait in a particular area or whether they move on to another area and then wait in that area instead. So individuals are competing for access to these finite resources that they're basically just sitting and waiting at and they will wait at the previous resource when the next resource is not available. So our key modeling parameters are then how often do these entities arrive, how often do these um, individuals, these marbles show up, and how long do they wait at each one of their stopping posts, how long do they wait at these processes. And so the advantage of this is that it's much more realistic than system dynamics modeling. We do get the minute by minute and day by day variation. But it's much faster to simulate than the agent-based models because we don't have to account for every single little position where, where an agent is because we still force them through a process. You know, we, we're almost forcing them through a mathematical equation. We're not allowing them to go anywhere. They have to go through our process, but we're allowing the kind of spacing of who arrives and how long they stay there to vary. So that's really where we're adding the variation. So the disadvantage um, of these things is that um, if you do have these really weird systems like some fancy uh, swarm-based um, manufacturing system of the future where millions of robots just bump into each other and then suddenly somehow a car gets built and we don't quite know how the car comes out but it does come out, then this doesn't really help us with that because we kind of need to know the process. It, it, I mean, it's great for like a more traditional manufacturing line where you kind of know this thing is here and then it goes here and then it goes here. Here's the potential places where there's bottlenecks, et cetera, et cetera. It also um, has the disadvantage that it requires maybe a little bit more mathematical background than some of the other uh, modeling types. So the system dynamics models, um, even though it's calculus behind the scenes, you draw graphically and all the math is done for you by the computer. The agent-based models, you might need a little bit of math to figure out how what happens with an individual when they bump into another individual, but it's still pretty simple to write these individual-based rules. Um, and then you just kind of let the computer let patterns emerge out of it. Here, we actually have to make choices about what probability distributions to use to decide when these marbles move from one point to another. And that's gonna require a little bit more math. And that's why we've got this course. So um, this is the, what a discrete event system simulation model might look like for a simple uh, airport security. Passengers arrive, they're generated here. They wait uh, while um, they either go directly into a document checker and it takes however long that takes or they wait for a document checker to become available, however long that takes. That document checker decides whether they pass security or not. 
And so if they pass security, they're cleared, and otherwise they go through some other process that we're just saying they get kicked out of the system and they're denied if they don't go through security. As that's running, we can plot things like the WIP, the work in progress, the number of individuals in the system, and we can even do little visualizations here. So we have a document checker that we visualize. This is the station where people start, uh, stop at in order to get their documents checked, and individuals will arrive and queue up down this depiction of a queue. So you get individuals that will pop up here. Even further, you can then add more sophisticated visualizations like the ones that you see here. So right now this simulation is running. This is in Arena. This is the program you'll learn how to use. And as you can see there, the animation is popping up in 2D here, but it's also being depicted in 3D down here. And then it's uh, a little slow right now, but you can see that the width uh, plots are being plotted over here too. And so this simulation is running. And although I'm saying that it's pretty simplistic, individuals always arrive here, they always go through here, they, then they're not, they're not doing anything as complicated as that agent-based model. Um, they still have uh, the ability to be visualized in a way that is very appealing to stakeholders. And so we can build simplistic models, but visualize them in a way that make them feel more realistic. Now, I'm not saying we're faking them out, like they're not actually this realistic, but we are more accurately depicting the realism by visualizing this way. Because sometimes, um, you know, in our abstractions, looking at marbles going through blocks like this, it just doesn't look very realistic. But if we turn those marbles into three-dimensional people, people start better understanding what we're actually simulating. So um, the model is not spatially explicit, but the visualization can show you how the model does simulate a very plausible spatial organization of the system. So if I move forward here. Um, so as another quick example here, this is a hospital emergency room. And you can see that cars are arriving, they're going through this little waiting area here, individuals are popping out of the cars, they're going to a waiting desk, they're waiting in this particular area, they're eventually being escorted to uh, another waiting area, and then they finally get into a bed, the beds are either occupied or not. I, I can go through the sequence of what happens for each individual. These are all of the possible delays that you could have when you come to the hospital emergency room. And it's a, it is a process, but it is a very understandable process. But I visualize it here, and I get a lot of the same benefits that I get out of an agent-based model, um, even though each individual is really just going through that same process that we're going through here. And I get realistic variation that comes out of that. So it can be a very appealing way to do simulation modeling. And then hey, you've Professor. got- uh, Yes. Uh, sorry, could you explain the difference between like the individuals that like have agency versus like don't have agency if they're still like going through the same, uh, you know, processes? Excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, so like in this hospital example, if I were to, um, you know, if I pause it somewhere, um, like this individual right here, in an agent-based model, um, individuals uh, are very aware of their context and in that we write rules into the individual so that when an individual uh, has a, an event, the individual says, looks around itself and says, what context am I in? Oh, I just bumped into a reception desk. Well, when I'm in a reception desk, I follow these rules. And then I do these rules and then I wait for my next indication that my context has changed. We write discrete event system simulation models differently than that. Rather than saying, we don't know what each entity is going to see and we wait until it sees it and then trigger um, a particular program. What we say is we say, no, we know that individuals that arrive will always go to the reception desk and we don't know how long they'll wait there. We're gonna program that. But then after um, they wait there, then they either will go directly into the emergency room waiting or they'll have go in this uh, preliminary waiting area here. And we might have to flip a coin to decide which one they go into. But at this point, we've taken the agency away from this individual. And we now the programming is more bookkeeping of where we put these individuals when they arrive. So it's kind of where the programming goes and how the flow of the program runs. And this, I think, will become more 
uh, salient as we move on in the semester. But um, sort of as a high level overview, you can think of it as, am I programming individuals or am I programming processes that kind of shepherd individuals around? Does that help? I think so. So basically, is it like, um, so folks that are in, I guess the, the uh, what's it called, the individuals who do have agency, they basically like do make decisions based off like the environment, whereas like the ones who don't have agency, like they still like make decisions, but they're like either like set decisions that we made for them or it's like completely randomized. Is that kind of right? That's, <clears throat> that's right. Um, and, and you can think of it like in the real world system, um, of course, individuals have agency, right? People decide what they're going to do. They might follow rules or they might not. But in our model of people, we have to decide where are we going to put that decision making in order to make the model go. And we either can say, we're just going to, like in that agent-based model video that I showed, we're going to have these individuals walk around randomly at the airport. And if they happen to hit a security gate, then they choose to go through it themselves. Um, or in the discrete event system simulation, we say, no, they arrive at the airport and then it takes them a certain amount of time to get to security and then they go through security. And then at security, we say they either make it through security or they don't. And then that determines where we send them next. So we are abstracting away the individual decision making in the discrete event system and we're putting it into kind of the airport and we're saying, well, where does the airport put them? But where the airport puts them is supposed to accurately model both the airport level processes and the individual level decisions. Hopefully that helps. And again, this I think will become more clear as we get further in the semester, but I just wanna give you a texture for this. See another question here. So would an agent-based model uh, individual in the airport example uh, count for like a probability that he just walks out of the line without going through security? And did you say we would not be dealing with individuals with agency in this class? What, no, it's not that we won't be dealing with agents, individuals in this, individuals, real world systems got individuals with agency and we got to deal with them. We will deal with them, but we model them differently. So in an agent based model, we model that agency as, so this example that was brought up in the chat, in an agent based model, you might give an individual the agency of when they're in a security line, that individual can decide at any instant that it wants to just exit the security line. And so we would have to write a rule on each individual and say, all right, so your individual, uh, we're gonna give you some program and that will determine when you want to exit security line or not. And we write those rules at the level of each individual that is in the security line. And so um, all the programs are kind of tied to each individual agent or entity. In the discrete event system simulation model, we instead say, we're gonna put the programming kind of in the security line instead of in the individuals in the security line. So the security line, we say the security line, okay, you have four individuals in the line. So the next accessible state is either to have five individuals, someone arrived, or three individuals, somebody departed. And we're gonna give you rules to determine when uh, someone departed or someone arrived. Um, and then so is agency related to their attributes or are they completely different? Um, so we are going to use the term attributes, like in, you can have a customer has luggage or not has luggage. Well, that's an attribute. So um, at a philosophical level, you can think of having agency as an attribute, but at a programming level, um, it's, it's different. It, at a programming level, it's just where do we put the code? Do we have, do we have 100 individual subroutines running? that we are going to simulate those subroutines um, bumping into each other and then, making, um, uh, uh, and then making decisions at the instant they bump into each other? Or do we have one subroutine running, but inside that subroutine, it has to keep track of, do I have 100 individuals and what those 100 individuals are doing? So it just, um, in, in the discrete event system simulation, we are putting the programming in the processes. We're putting the programming in the security line in the cashier, in the airport. Um, and then the individuals are just things that, are, that we, keep, we do bookkeeping for. But in the agent-based modeling approach, we can still model the airport, but the programming is not in the airport, it's in the individuals in the airport. And so we have to write, every single thing that happens in the airport has to be encoded into a program we write into the individual, into the passenger. Whereas instead, the discrete event system, we put the programming in the airport. 
And so everything that happens in the airport will have to be encoded into programming we write into the airport logic. So you just imagine it's two perspectives on how an airport works from the individual perspective of how I got from point A to point B and all of the decisions I made. And from the airport perspective, how did I route this person from point A to point B? Um, it's just two different ways of modeling the logic for how an airport works. And they have consequences for how fast the simulation runs and what types of questions you can ask about the system you simulate. I hope that helps. Again, I think it'll be more clear as we move forward. I'm just trying to give you a texture of, um, of, of these three different types of simulation methodology. Any other questions about that? All right. So these um, discrete event system simulations, just like agent-based models, can generate these realistic variations, as you see down here. Um, and but they're written in a very simple way. So this is maybe I hope this will also help. Um, whereas in a the logic for an agent based model, I would have to open up code for um, are all of customers who are um, in a single family arrival have this logic. All of customers that have uh, two individuals, well, this individual has this logic and this individual has this other logic. I have to go into each individual and say, what is your program for each individual type? And then I put a thousand of those individuals together. The way I model an emergency room, for example, um, I don't model the logic at the level of the patients going through the emergency room. I model the logic of what happens um, in how do we secure a bed? How long does it take to delay um, in waiting for a room to be pre prepared? How long does it take to secure a nurse? So I'm now modeling logic at the kind of room level as opposed to the patient level. And that will determine where the patients are, but I don't care about like where the patients are walking around within the room. All I need to know is that they're in the room. In an agent-based model, I need to know where they are in the room, how long they, um, stay in one part of the room. If I want to model the microscopic features of how people move in an unconstrained environment, I do an agent-based model because that allows me to model the logic of individuals moving around unconstrained models. If I zoom out and I say, I don't really care what they do in the waiting room, but I care how long they're in the waiting room, and I care where they go after the waiting room, then I'm focused on the process of moving them through the hospital. And that process-centric model is a discrete event system. Um, and here, is waiting considered a delay or an activity? Excellent question. We'll get into that. Um, the, um, the, it depends on kind of what caused. So there's this, this distinction between waiting, uh, between activities and delays, and we will cover that. And so I'm doing a delay uh, answering that question for a little bit later. But thank you for that. All right, so in the, our airport security example, this again, so just as just another example of what you could build in a discrete event system simulation, I'm modeling the process. I don't care about exactly all of the details of what someone's doing while the document checker is looking at their ID, um, but I do care how long it takes for the document checker to look at their ID. And so I'm modeling the process here. So they're relatively simple because I don't worry about all of the things the individuals are doing. And I again, still get these realistic variations. I can, I can measure all sorts of things. And each one of them not only has an average, like in a system dynamics model, but it has a variation. It has a hash width, a confidence interval associated with it. So I get real stats out of these models. So lots of different performance metrics and all of them have true variation. So they look very realistic. And they're used in a wide range of industrial systems. And so there are a wide range of simulation tools. Arena is just one of them. Almost all of them have got a 3D front end because stakeholders love seeing 3D entities moving around. I personally think it's a waste of time. Uh, I never go through this part. But that's because I don't have to deal with a whole lot of stakeholders. Uh, those of you who actually go out and, um, and, and work in the business, this will be a big part of what you do is not only coming up with results, but also coming up with ways of depicting those results in the ways that communicates the idea best to the individual. And sometimes individuals just don't like seeing dots on a plane. They really like seeing 3D individuals because it helps their mental models. They, they can say, aha, I, 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 this looks like Ikea or something like that. And, and they can say, you know, I can picture this in my head and it allows them to then take your, your results 
and filter them through their mental models. That's what the 3D models really help with. And a lot of these tools like Arena have that. They're also used outside of industry. So here's a relatively recent article where Arena was used to optimize the gleaning schedule at a food bank. So a food bank realized there were a bunch of apples that uh, were being thrown away after a harvest for various reasons, and they needed to figure out how to allocate volunteers to go out and get those. But all those volunteers had their own constraints. They weren't always available. And so uh, they needed to come up with a model that was allowed them to figure out how best to assign volunteers to different places to get these apples. And they built a process level model. So there's a high level model over here that they implemented in Arena, I'm not showing all the details here. And that allowed them in simulation to optimize the gleaning schedule for this food bank. So a lot of different application spaces. So, Holding off on this like activity delay thing, are there any other questions that I want to get to? Um, we've already asked a lot of great questions so far. Any other quick questions before we drill down a little bit more? All right, well, I won't pause as much as usual because we had a couple of questions. I'm going to skip that attendance exercise. Um, so we'll have another one later. So um, now we've got some of these modeling terms that have already been brought up a little bit in the, in the questions. Um, so that's what's coming up right here. So these modeling terms are terms you're going to need for that first lab, which I'm hoping some of you looked at, and that first homework that's coming up next week, which is already available. So one of the modeling terms we have are system. I mean, you use this a lot. It's a, I'm just going to call it a group of objects connected by some joint purpose. What I really care about in systems are the system's boundaries. So a boundary of the system depends on kind of all of the things you want to include. So if we were modeling a classroom in a normal time, we might be like 100 students in a specific classroom with an instructor. I, that, I draw a boundary around that system. I don't care about things outside that boundary. I might not care about the weather that day because I'm only interested in the operations in the inside that classroom. Is the instructor available? How many students are there? Um, how well is that particular class going? Now, if I scale up, to an uh, you know, ASU-sized university, 100,000 students on campus walking around, now I have to um, think about, um, are there classes or not? Um, is the weather good or not? How hot is it out? Um, uh, what rooms are available? These sorts of things. And so I have totally different set of questions that came from me expanding the boundary of my interest. I don't need to worry about those things if I'm only modeling an individual classroom. So I draw my boundaries and forget about everything outside of them. But if I do have questions that are at the university scale, I need to then bring in details, more realism. So I trickle in the realism as I need it. A dynamical system, so we had systems. The systems can be static. Um, they can you know, be like a, a bank account or something like that. If you're balancing a checkbook, you, know, you can sort of view that as a, as a system or dynamic, how they balance changes over time. So a system that can be observed as it changes over time is what we're calling a dynamical system. And in any dynamical system, we have the notion of state. And so we're going to use this term state a lot. So the state is the current, if, if a system is changing, you have to say, well, what's changing? The state of the system is changing. Any snapshot at any time, you're capturing the state of a system. As the system moves from one time to another, you take a snapshot and things look different. Things look different because the state has changed. So the state is capturing everything you need to know about the system at that instant of time. And then the state changes as you move from instant of time to instant of time. So um, if we draw boundaries around our system, that kind of restricts how many things we need to include in our system state. So as an example, five passengers are waiting in line while two out of the three agents are busy checking identification. That's an example of the state of an airport. Now that's if I'm only interested in say security operations at the airport. I didn't include how many planes are currently waiting to take off. So that is an aspect I've left out of the, the state of the airport. Um, so um, state variables are the actual things that we use to store the state in. So if, um, if a state is number of passengers, then maybe n would be a variable we use to store the number of passengers. And so these two things, we um, make sure you don't get these two terms confused, is that a state variable is the placeholder we use to sort of keep track of state. 
and the individual values that are, are, that are in those variables are the actual states themselves. So number of pastors waiting in line, in quotes, number of pastors waiting in line, that is a state variable, but three is the state. So that's the difference between those two. And then we have discrete states, which uh, change at count countable instants of time. It's three, and then at some instant it jumps to four versus continuous variables. So if I were to throw this ball through the air, the height of this ball would be a state variable, but it would smoothly move through a variety of heights um, at every instant of time. And so there would not be a discrete change in its height, it would smoothly flow. So that's the difference between a continuous state variable, height, and a discrete state variable, number of passengers. Any questions about these kind of fundamental terms? And in our discrete event system simulations, we are primarily working with discrete state variables. We are not worried about the height of a ball as it flies through the air. We're worried about things as they change at events. And so the time in which a discrete uh, variable changed is we're calling an event. All right, so um, in these processes, we now have, um, these are important words uh, for your homework. We have these things called resources. So a resource is a component that's in limited quantity that delays entities as it moves through it. The time that an entity spends within a resource is an activity. So um, an activity is not the time you spend waiting for a resource to become available. The activity is the time you spend uh, in the resource. Resources do not come and go they can become unavailable, but whereas entities are coming into the system and going out of the system, resources are always there. The document checker is a resource. Um, it's always there, we, at least in our model, but entities, passengers, arrive to the document checker. So x-ray scanners, TSA officers, etc. The entities are the things that are moving in and out of the system. They're the things being delayed. So um, if, they, if an entity is in a resource, we view that entity as waiting out a activity. Um, so that is a, um, uh, an unconditioned wait. We know on average how long it's gonna take for that activity to, to, to um, finish. But if that entity is waiting for a resource to become available, then we call that a conditioned wait, or um, it is a delay. And so a delay is when you don't know how long it's going to take because it depends upon other entities uh, going through their activities. So if another entity is in a resource consuming the resource, then you have to wait for that entity to get out of there. So the entity that is waiting on the resource, that's sitting in this limbo waiting to get into the resource, that limbo time is the delay. So that's the difference between a delay and an activity. An activity is when you're in the resource, a delay is when you're waiting for the resource. And then attributes, that's things that we pin to the entities to differentiate between them. How much luggage do you have? Do you have children with you? Um, what color is your shirt? Um, what is your ID? So, you know, what, what um, you know, you came in, you were the first customer, you're the second customer, the ID that was stamped on you. These are all attributes. And then activity versus delay, which I just went over there. So as an example for a manufacturing system, parts arrived to a manufacturing system, they're assembled and then they move out. So um, entities are the uh, parts in the manufacturing system, but these parts each have individual attributes. Some of them are heavy, some of them are light, some of them have part numbers, colors, the time that the part arrived, you know, it's like, it, it might be that this thing is, um, it's, it arrives and it must be used within an hour. And so knowing exactly when it arrived is important because whether it's getting about to go stale might depend on whether we need to prioritize making use of it. The resources are the things the parts are processed through. So the machines that put the parts together, those resources are always there. So they're resources. The time it takes for the part to go through the machine is the activity and the time it takes for the part to wait for the part in front of it to go through that machine is a delay. The events are whenever something exits a machine, whenever something enters a machine, 
whenever a machine breaks down, anything that triggers an activity is an event. And the state variable is, um, is a, a variable that we use as a placeholder for whether a machine is idle or busy. So this m sub i is a state variable representing that machine i is either idle or busy. So m i is the state variable, and each of these are the two states that the machine could be in. So the state of the whole system is the collection of state variables, which you might call a state vector. And then the state of the system is this five-dimensional uh, number you know, 11001 indicating that three machines are busy and two are idle. Delays are not a subset of activities. They are, this is a question, is delays, um, uh, are delays a subset of activities? Um, delays are not a subset of activities. Delays are separate from activities. Activities are the time you wait in a resource. Delays are the time you are waiting for a resource. And then um, uh, Anna or Anna, you had your hand raised. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, I was I was wondering. Um, so, for example, in the lab, we were we we're gonna do. So, for example, we would have to uh, put in events, or um, it would be well. So, I was wondering, the delays aren't included in the lab that we went through. And for example, I chose one of my uh, activities as like the time it takes. Well, the time of idle as in waiting for a customer or something like that. Would that be I see. wrong to? Usually we view idle times as these delays because not as activities because they, um, another way that I'll define activities is if you can guess the average time ahead of time without knowing anything else about the system, then it's an activity. But if you actually need to run the system, in order to figure out how long that's going to take, then it's a delay. So in the case of how long a machine is going to be idle, you know, it, it depends on what customers arrive. Now, once a customer or a part goes into the machine, I know on average that that machine takes five minutes to process that part, maybe with some variation. But I don't need to know anything else about the system to know it's going to take five minutes to get through that machine. I don't know ahead of time that it's going to take an hour for the next part to arrive to that machine. Now things get a little hairy here because I might know that on average it takes an hour for the next part to arrive to the system. So, um, but in general, we kind of think about um, idle times or anything where it's like you're waiting on the next thing and it kind of, um, those sort of are usually probably going to be binned into delays. But you really just kind of ask, I have to ask myself, would it be possible for me to build a statistical distribution for this waiting period without knowing um, other details about the system? And if you have to know other details about the system in order to make a guess at how long that waiting period is going to be, it's a delay. If you can make a good guess without knowing anything else about the system, then it's an activity. Okay, so, um, so if, for example, I would just like change the wording then to being like instead of the idle time, it would be the usage time. Um, I, you, you, yeah, if you if if you were to say the the time the machine, um, the it would it have to be the whole duration, the the time it takes for a machine to process one part. That is an activity, one part, not two parts or three parts or four parts, because you don't know how quickly those one to four parts arrive. But one part, you know that the instant the machine starts with one part, you have a good idea of how long it's going to take to process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I see, is it, a, um, is it a wait in a resource or a spent in a resource for activities since delay is a wait for a resource? Um, you could, I don't know what you mean by spent in a resource, but I would say that an activity you can view as a weight. Um, it's fine to view it as, as a weight in a resource. Um, it gets a little funny when we, um, when we think about arrivals to systems because we actually think of the time in between arrivals as an activity. Because we, without knowing anything about the system, we know on average people arrive to the system with this average time in between them. So fundamentally it's about whether you can guess the probability distribution ahead of time without knowing anything about the system. But um, 
you could definitely say that if you are in a resource waiting for that resource to finish processing you, then it is an activity. If you are outside a resource waiting for someone else to give you access to the resource, then it is a delay. If you're waiting in line, you're being delayed. If you're waiting for a teller to finish your, uh, what you needed that teller to do, it's an activity. So if you're, if you're in a queue, it's probably a delay. If you're the head of a queue being processed, it's probably an activity. Activities are always durations. Activities and delays are always lengths of time. Events are instants. So the instant you go into the, the machine, that's an event. The instant you enter the bank, that's an event. The instant the fire alarm goes off and the bank becomes out of service, that's an event. But an activity is a duration of time. How long are you going to spend at the teller? How long are you going to spend in the machine? Okay, great questions. So all the right questions. Uh, professor? Yep. I just have one more question. So, uh -huh. um, so for the lab, uh, the emergency room one, uh, would, I, would uh, assigning medication considered as activity by a doctor? Um, I would say that the, um, it, 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 this sort of depends on the time scale of interest. If it takes um, minutes for a doctor to write a prescription for a medication, for example, then that would be an activity. Because you know, if it's one of those times where you say, okay, you just met, you, you saw the doctor and he says, all right, let me write you a prescription for an antibiotic. The time it takes for that doctor to go out of the room, get the pen, get the piece of paper, write the prescription, do whatever it is that they need to do, and then come back to you. If that is all the doctor is doing, is it going out, fill, you know, doing the prescription, coming back, and it still takes him an appreciable period of time, we would call that an activity. Now, if um, that, in order for him to finish that prescription, involves him also seeing other patients, then it gets more complicated because there's like microscopic activities that are other people's activities are actually contributing to how long you're waiting. So then it's kind of a delay. But, um, but then on, alternatively, if, um, if he can just write a prescription and it's effectively instantaneous, then we may not even need to model it we can just say that um, we went through a state change at that instant and you went from not having a prescription to having a prescription. So that would be an event because a state variable uh, changed whether you have a prescription. Okay, thank you. So I'm not gonna go through this one in detail just um, so that we don't run too far behind here, uh, but this is another example that I've put up here that you can review. And this would be like how we would model a classroom. And so I've got um, you know, entities, attributes, resources, activities, delays, events, and state variables, as well as the states that go into those state variables. So you know, I'll, I'll leave that there for you to review and add us a lot of questions. So I just wanna make sure we get to a couple other things here. Um, these are the symbols that we will use um, throughout the rest of the course. So this kind of symbol here in process logic is what we use is to create entities. This rectangle is processes entities. This is where the activities live. Um, so the delays are kind of in between things, whereas the activities are inside here. The diamond from kind of flowchart logic, this is what allows entities to enter from one side and then come out multiple other sides. They can come out one side or the other. And then the entities are collected or disposed at this thing that kind of looks like the flip of the thing that creates them, which is over here. So um, those things get strung together in um, our, our models. And the events, which are kind of the bookends, every activity is bookended by an event. And, um, and, the, um, and the, the events are generated in the block that creates them as well as the block that processes them. And, um, and again, there was a question about um, when uh, about classroom and lab availability. And again, we're hiring somebody to allow you to go into classrooms. Hopefully when they get hired, it'll be hopefully as soon as next week, I'll send an announcement. And, um, and then uh, likewise, there'll be a similar announcement about labs for those who want physical access to the classroom. The um, basic process symbols, so I just, this is what those look like inside ARENA. Again, um, it's um, they have a stream of arrivals. We have how long it takes for those entities to get processed. 
And then the delays happen, that's how long they wait in the line that's kind of in between these. Some passengers are cleared, some are not. And so again, this is another example of what our entities, resources, and activities are, our events. So this is just another graphical example of how we break these things up. All right. So I do want to get into one last thing here. So um, so we've got a lot of great questions. So I'm just going to stream uh, directly into this is that where the randomness comes into play. So our goal is to model the time between arrivals and the time of how long it takes to actually process these entities when they go through these activities. So we need to model the activities. And so one activity is how long it takes to wait for the next customer. The next activity is when the customer finally gets to the ID checker, how long does it take for the ID checker to, to run? And then we also need to model how many passengers go in to um, are cleared and how many passengers are not. Now, in order to model this, we, um, there's a bunch of different ways that we could model how passengers arrive to a system. Now, if we think in reality, what happens with an airport is that, um, and there's a question, can the entity change in the process? Yes, entities can change their attributes in the process. You can actually view entity attributes as state variables that you have, can keep track of as well. So whether the state variable is bolted to the world or bolted to an, uh, to a, uh, a, an entity might um, affect whether it's an attribute or not, but attributes can change. So an entity can change as it's being moved through the process, in which case the entity's attributes can actually become a part of a kind of a state variable as well. All right, so if we wanna think about what happens in a real airport, somebody arrives at a particular time before their flight in an hour period, now there might be someone else arrives, maybe a family, and they arrive um, and they're a little bit, um, they arrive later than that. Maybe this is a new family, they only have one kid, and so um, they are not ready for, um, for all the delays that had happened at, at home, and so they arrive a little later and, and uh, it's, a little, it's a little closer, a little dicier. Someone else, maybe they have two kids, they know they needed to provide a little extra time, and so they arrive much, much earlier than, um, than the rest of them. And then someone else arrives way late just because they're just somebody who arrives late. Now it could be that uh, for another flight, someone else arrives. Now when we're monitoring the airport, we see these five arrivals and the time in between them. And we have no idea about all of these different details. And so um, we would like to be able to simulate realistic arrivals that end up recapitulating all of the different details that happen with real arrivals like this. Now, one way to deal with that is we can look at the average behavior and we can say that on average, we got five customers per hour, five passengers per hour. And um, so that's about 20 minutes between each arrival. So a deterministic approach would be to just say, we are going to space arrivals equally every 20 minutes. And that's maybe okay from like a system dynamics modeling approach, but it's not very realistic. So another approach, is we could try to come up with a formula that keeps them you know, based on family size, based on, uh, pardon me for my dog, based on family size, based on the temperament of the individual, based on all sorts of other details, we could come up with a formula for how long the space in, in between every individual. But that's also not very realistic. This is where are we going to get this formula for how individuals work? So the approach that we'll take and the approach that I will go into more detail in uh, since we're getting to the end of time here, probably the beginning of next lecture, is we are going to say, what if we just randomly drew the time in between uh, individuals? If we randomly drew the time in between individuals, then we would get results that would look very much like the realistic results, but um, we wouldn't need all of the details that go into actually the realistic factors that go in between the individuals. And so this is what we refer to as stochastic modeling. It's using randomness in place of details. It's making models simpler using randomness. And so, um, you know, I'll go into again this um, a more next lecture, and I think I'll probably maybe end here. So what I'm gonna do is give everybody the attendance exercise. And um, if there's any other questions, I can take those after that. So for the attendance exercise here today, um, my question is, uh, I am modeling the duration of time it takes for a passenger 
to get through a document checker. So they've, they've already waited in line and now they're at the document checker and I'm just modeling how much time it takes for the document checker to check that passenger's ID. Is that duration of time an activity or a delay? So put that, go to this uh, website and I can put it in the chat and just put in activity or delay. Is the time that the document checker, checker takes, I'll put that in the, send that to everybody, a, um, not the time they're waiting in line, but the time the document checker takes to check an individual's document, is that an activity or a delay? And I'll leave that up and then I can hang around for a minute or two or there, if there's any questions, otherwise, if there's no questions, then I will see you next class and you can feel free to, to leave the uh, room. Professor, could you repeat the question, please? The question was, um, is activity or delay? And um, in the end, if you're having any access troubles here, it's because you're not logging in with your ASU account. You have to log in with your ASU email into Gmail in order to have access to this Google form. So if it gives you an access denied error, then you need to go to uh, Google Drive and log in with your ASU account and switch focus to your ASU account before you can go to this. And if you're having trouble doing that in your mobile device, it is possible in your mobile device, but if you're having trouble with that, then I'd recommend uh, the next time you're at a desktop machine in the next 24 hours, then you can answer the question there. So the question was activity or delay, time it takes for a document checker to um, check an individual's documents. And I'll send that to everyone. I put that in the chat. Any other questions? All right. Well, it's 1147, so uh, if no other questions, I don't want to keep anybody else here uh, later. So I will um, see everybody then on Tuesday. So have a good weekend. Stay safe.